Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Agathe Piquet, co-manager of the Next UK project with Dr. Sarah Wolf. Next UK is the Jean Monnet Centre for Excellence, led by the Centre for European Research at Queen Mary University of London, and is co-funded by the European Commission through the Erasmus Plus scheme. Next UK is about uh, the EU-UK relations and gathers academics and practitioners to produce new insights and policy recommendations on this very topical question. And I'm uh, Dr. Helena Farrakar-Biko. I'm Jean-Marie Chier, an associate professor at Northumbria University, where I'm also director of research. Uh, this event today is the result of the cooperation between the Jean-Marie Centre at Queen Mary University and the Jean-Marie Chier at Northumbria University. Uh, the chair, which is also funded by the Erasmus Plus, just like the uh, centre, um, focuses on the UK-EU security relationship post-Brexit and offers students, academics and practitioners um, an insight into the different political and legal dynamics of the UK and the EU's new developing internal security relationship. So we're very glad to, to welcome you all to today's events entitled Freedom, Security and Justice Post-Brexit. So this is a policy roundtable uh, that will gather practitioners and academics from the UK and from the European Union to discuss how internal security, justice and freedom of movement in both Britain and Europe have been impacted by the UK's withdrawal. This uh, new format aims to offer some avenue for policymakers and academics from both sides to exchange evidence-based views, to identify common interests and problems, and to formulate some solutions to the current situation through policy recommendations. This is the main reason why this event will be recorded and why we will write a policy brief based on today's event. We will then be disseminated to a wider audience. The, the majority of the audience here today is probably familiar with the historical developments over the course of the past couple of years in relation to the UK-EU uh, security relationship, but we still thought that actually it would be useful to start with the event by summarizing some of them. So since the 90s and until the end of the transition phase in 2020, the UK-EU Justin Home Affairs relationship was managed through a series of opt-ins and opt-outs, which granted the UK we can say flexibility, quite a lot of flexibility in deciding which legal instruments it wanted to take part in and which ones it didn't want to take part in, allowing it to still make considerable contributions to the direction of the area of freedom, security and justice. And this relationship can mainly be um, essentially divided in three temporal phases. So the first one is what we call the intergovernmental and cherry picking phase, which goes from 92 to up to 2010 more or less. And 92 marks the introduction of the Justin Home Affairs pillar with the uh, Treaty of Maastricht, where the UK could still exercise its right to veto given the unanimity requirement. And during this period, the UK decided to cherry pick, that's actually the best expression really, its preferred policy options as supranationalization of just home affairs was introduced with the Treaty of Amsterdam. From the UK side, this form of selective participation in the area of and justice was long perceived as delivering key benefits, namely by playing a crucial role in supporting the UK's efforts in tackling cross-border crime and enhancing its channel security without bearing the cost of community decision-making. So this cherry picking path is then further accelerated by the 2007 Treaty of Lisbon with the introduction of Protocol 36, which offered the UK the possibility of opting out en masse from all pre-Lisbon police and judicial cooperation instruments. So 2010 marks the start of the second temple phase with mainly with the arrival of the coalition government and what we usually call this phase a contested participation phase. It led to an evolution of the previous UK position following the Lisbon Treaty's removal of the EU pillar structure. This move meant a broader supranationalization of these topics, a dynamic that UK the UK was proving very reluctant to, especially in terms of the prospect of expanding the Court of Justice jurisdiction in the area of freedom, security and justice. As a result, the UK announced in 2012 that it intended to mass opt out from the 130 pre-Lisbon police and judicial cooperation measures it was taking part of. That was made possible again by what I just mentioned, by Protocol 36 of the treaty. And uh, despite that possibility, the UK still decided to actually opt back into 35 of those 130 measures, which were considered to be essential for the continued security of the UK. So in a way, the UK strategy in this field highlights that as an EU member state, the UK tended to prioritize its operational needs over its more long-term ambivalent vision of European integration. And that was actually eager to push for differentiated integration. The final phase uh, starts with the 2016 referendum. And um, 
leading up to the withdrawal of the UK from the EU. The Brexit referendum acts a priori as a type of critical juncture, mostly driven by internal factors, political internal factors, as it initiates a period of significant change. Indeed, Brexit is presented rhetorically as a revolution, as unprecedented, and as creating a new window of opportunity to de-Europeanize and take back control. It is important to mention, however, that internal security was rarely featured during referendum discussions, allowing for quite a limited reflection on this topic as a society as a whole. And it is only with the negotiations of the withdrawal agreement that it slowly gained in importance. Over the course of the transition, following the negotiation of the withdrawal agreement, the UK and the EU negotiated a new security partnership as part of the Trade and Cooperation Agreement. Part three of the TCA covers police and judicial cooperation in criminal matters, which in the words of the UK government, provides a comprehensive package of operational capabilities that will help protect the public and bring criminals to justice. Despite this optimistic perspective, the TCA offers a mixed picture in relation to the pre-Brexit security relationship with areas of continuing engagement, reduced engagement, and actually disengagement. So I'm just going to give a few examples of what these are. Areas of continuing engagement include, for example, data sharing through PRUM, uh, data sharing through ECRIS, the European Criminal Record Information System, and through the passenger name record. Areas of extradition, on the other hand, uh, the area of extradition, on the other hand, is marked by reduction in cooperation, as is the mutual legal assistance area in criminal, uh, criminal investigations, the participation in Europod, participation in Eurojust, and also in the joint investigations teams. But obviously, the most noticeable area of reduced engagement is really the access to the Schengen information system. Too. And the clear example of disengagement is the area of migration and asylum, in particular with freedom of movement coming to an end and British nationals becoming third country nationals, as well as EU citizens transitioning to the settled status scheme. Since 2016, there's been quite a few uh, opinion pieces, institutional reports, uh, namely House of Board reports, and academic articles and books on the possible consequences of Brexit for the UK and the EU's internal security. There's also been quite a lot of few, well, quite a lot of legal analysis on section three of the TCA. So what we're mainly, mainly missing at the moment, and we're hoping that today's workshop will contribute to addressing this gap, is firstly an insight into the operational impact that the TCA is having on police and judicial cooperation on both sides. And secondly, a reflection on where we can go from here. The TCA may have entered into force, but it will likely evolve through renegotiation in the future. In practice, the TCA is merely the legal framework that allows the UK and the EU to start a new relationship, which will certainly require continued adjustments. And in some forms of and, and if some forms of cooperation are no longer possible through the TCA, it's also interesting to reflect and to explore what informal compensatory mechanisms uh, or platforms are actually emerging. In any case, only it's been barely a year since the signature of the TCA, strong concerns have already been expressed in relation to its impact um, on internal security. So I'll just like to mention some of these questions which might be useful during the discussions we're gonna have today. So some of the questions are, to what extent does the TCA actually offer the UK and the EU the necessary level of cooperation to ensure their security? Will the EU and the UK find solutions to the questions not answered by the TCA in relation to freedom, security and justice? How is the area of freedom, security and justice developing in the absence of the UK? And if I can be a bit more controversial, is that absence even felt? What progress has been made towards creating a UK-EU parliamentary assembly uh, that will manage the, the partnership? If the UK is not granted the commission data adequacy determination, or if it's withdrawn at a certain stage, what will happen to the police and judicial cooperation? Will officials from the UK and the EU be able to trust each other and to cooperate despite deteriorating EU-UK relations? Although in the past couple of weeks, we've seen an improvement of that, of said uh, relations. And will the UK and EU citizens be offered the same level of justice and security post-Brexit times? Having just done a bit of a summary of what we've actually encountered over the past few uh, couple of years, I will now just like to actually uh, announce the, the structure of today's uh, event. So obviously we will conclude this with introductory remarks and uh, at 9.15 or maybe one or two minutes before we will start the keynote uh, uh, which is uh, offered by Sir Julian King and the topic will be meeting shared challenges, protecting our shared values. Then we'll have a coffee break between 10.15 and 10.30 and then we will start the first panel at 10.30 
you can't always get what you want, the impact of Brexit on UK internal security. And that panel will actually feature Lord Ricketts, Professor Kristen Kaunert, Baroness Hamwee, and Professor Elaine Fahey. Uh, unfortunately, Dr. Sarah Wolf can't join us today, but uh, very kindly, uh, Dr. Ben uh, uh, Martel, uh, Benjamin Martel from the University of Edinburgh has offered to chair this uh, session. Uh, we will then have a lunch break between 12 and 1, and then at 1 we will start panel 2 with or without the UK, post-Brexit area of freedom, security and justice, and we'll have Dr. Chloe Prière, and we'll have Ms. Camino Mortena Martinez and Professor Florian Trauner, uh, and that panel will be chaired by Dr. Agathe Piquet. And I just want to reiterate uh, what Agathe has already mentioned and uh, to thank everyone for actually joining us today, both audience and uh, uh, speakers. And uh, with this, we are just two minutes, one minute ahead of time. I think we can actually, um, I'd like to maybe start us directly with the uh, uh, keynote speech. And I would like to welcome Sir Julian King. I'd just like to introduce him. So Sir Julian uh, was the UK's EU Commissioner between 2006 and 2019. He was responsible for EU policy on security, cyber and important aspects of tech and data. With the United Kingdom's withdrawal from the European Union on the 31st of January 2020, he was the last British official to hold a position and portfolio within the Commission. He joined the Foreign and Commonwealth Office in 85. Sir Julian has held various positions, uh, including uh, in he was no nominated UK Ambassador to France in 2016, Director General Economic and Cultural Affairs in 2014, Director General of the Northern Ireland Office, London and Belfast in 2011, UK Ambassador to Ireland in 2009, EU Commission Chef de Cabinet to Commissioner for Trade, 2008, UK Representative on EU Political and Security Committee in 2004, Overall, he has had 30 years of experience working on international and multilateral issues in the UK, the US and Brussels. Sir so Julian is a graduate of Oxford University and of the École Nationale d'Administration in Paris. He is currently a specialist partner with Flynn Goble, a distinguished fellow at RUSI and a visiting fellow, policy fellow at Oxford University. Thank you so much, Sir Julian, for joining us today and for, uh, you know, for, for offering us the possibility of actually uh, listening to your reflections on this topic. Thank you. Well, no, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, you've got um, some fantastic participants in your sessions today uh, who are going to be able to go into quite a lot of depth and detail on the questions that you're, that you're posing. I, I just thought I'd kick off by um, talking for a little while, and then I think the idea is that we can have some, some questions and a bit of a discussion as well uh, to, try and, to try and set and um, frame uh, the, the subject. Uh, uh, picking up some of the points that you've you've just made, Helena, I have to say, uh, how did we get to where we are, as well as as well as looking a little bit at what the prospects um, might be uh, for next steps, and taking account of some of the some of the politics uh, uh, as well as the technicalities. Uh, that said, you've got some uh, uh, people on various panels who will be able to comment uh, with even more authority on the politics, particularly seen from a a UK perspective. Uh, so I wanted just to start by noting that uh, there are some distinctions in, in uh, the field of security that are that are often used, which which remain valid up to a point. Uh, there are distinctions sometimes made between old or traditional uh, security threats and and new security threats like uh, terrorism, extremism. Uh, the various forms of cyber challenge, uh, the use and misuse of our of our interconnected world uh, to uh, pursue criminal objectives, sometimes to pursue state-sponsored objectives, to spread uh, uh, hate and and division. Uh, there are also challenges around securing um, our digital plumbing, the critical digital infrastructure that we all rely upon so much these days. And the distinction between uh, traditional security threats and some of these newer threats has, I think, um, uh, has blurred. Uh, and you can see that by the pursuit of a mix of different uh, security means in what's sometimes called uh, hybrid challenges or hybrid attacks. There's a slight risk that that label is being used too much uh, in too blanket a way, but 
it, it definitely describes a reality, a reality that has been felt um, uh, uh, in recent years across different parts of, of Europe. And there's another blurring uh, between internal security, which is the main subject for discussion today, uh, the whole justice and home affairs field, and external security, or uh, in other terms, um, foreign policy and international security. Uh, and uh, obviously, there are still some distinctions in how those fields are organized. The people who are involved, the uh, players who are involved, some of the considerations involved. But again, I think there has been progressively over recent years, a blurring. There's certainly a strong linkage between uh, questions that uh, are treated under internal security and foreign policy and international security. To state one obvious example that's very much in the news at the moment, there is the uh, weaponization of migration that we're seeing on the uh, Polish border with, with Belarus, but there are other examples as well. Why do I start here talking about, about definitions and how they're becoming blurred? Well, I think it's really important that security challenges as they evolve, um, necessitate uh, our response uh, changing and evolving to try and meet those challenges. And it's against that backdrop that I think that the European Union has emerged over a number of years as an, an important security actor, not always recognized as such, not by uh, everyone at least. But because the nature of the threats that we face today are hybrid, uh, blur some of those distinctions that I've just been talking about, you need to have a multifaceted response. You, of course, still need to have uh, traditional and hard security responses. And there's a range of organizations and groupings uh, and relationships that can help to deliver that. But you also need to have uh, a, a response that has an, a, a different sort of deterrent effect uh, because it can work across many different policy areas uh, and work with many different policy actors, not just uh, across governments and member states, but also uh, crucially at the private sector because many of these um, threats and the um, that the way they work through uh, involve private sector actors uh, and civil society, because the way you deal with many of these threads requires action across the whole of society, including civil society actors. And you need to have a mix of policy instruments to respond to these different threats. And that's where the European Union comes in. The European Union has that range of relationships and that range of policy instruments that it can deploy to be an effective uh, security actor, delivering a form of deterrence, and if necessary, delivering a form of response to manage and mitigate some of these threats. I'll come back to that uh, uh, later on, but I think it's very important that uh, and many people on this call will accept it, but it's not been generally accepted, including in the UK domestic debate, to note that the European Union can have that role amongst other actors as a security actor. The UK has, uh, you, you, you categorize the development over three stages, cherry picking, contested, and then sort of post-referendum. I, I would just like to say, perhaps slightly more positively, uh, that the UK has been engaged uh, uh, over the years, uh, made a contribution, and in fact has given some leadership in at least some of the areas that the EU addresses uh, on security, internal and external. So the UK has made a contribution over the years on, on external um, international security. I would pick out that there are others on the call who will have other examples, but I would pick out um, sanctions policy, uh, a, a very important uh, aspect of EU security work where the UK was often uh, a, a leading contributor to developing the thinking and 
um, then finding ways of implementing sanctions work while member state. But in fact, uh, it's also made a contribution to uh, EU thinking and work on um, expeditionary activities uh, through what was then CFSP, CFSDP, uh, and uh, through the building, thinking about and then delivering the building of um, uh, increased military capability for uh, EU and other use. Uh, and that goes all the way back to um, the UK presidency of the EU in, in 2005, uh, when the, the number of small but important targeted uh, expeditionary uh, missions with an EU flag went from four to 14 in the space of the six months of the UK presidency. So it, so it has historically made a contribution uh, across those fields. And when you come to internal uh, security issues, uh, again, perhaps slightly more positively than the picture that you, you, you painted earlier, uh, I would say that the uh, UK has made a, cons made a consistent uh, contribution on, on policing uh, matters, uh, often despite the politics. I mean, you referred to the, the whole debate around um, uh, Protocol 36, the, the opt-out, opt-in. That was very contested, but uh, the, the red thread that runs through uh, uh, that debate were, were the practitioners led by the police, the NCA, saying they, they really valued some of these instruments for cooperation. They really wanted to continue to be engaged. They helped win the political argument uh, that uh, was, was raging around Protocol 36. Another area where there's been quite a significant contribution uh, over the years, speeding up more recently, uh, has been cyber, cyber security and cyber policy, uh, because uh, the UK was, is, uh, one of the leading um, thinkers and, and practitioners around uh, cyber security. And it, it certainly helped shape uh, the way the EU uh, has been thinking about uh, that aspect of internal security. So uh, uh, you might say that that's only in some areas. So there's been an element of cherry picking. Uh, you certainly can say that uh, this contribution has at times been contested uh, politically, both in the UK and by some of the UK's partners uh, uh, across Europe, but it exists. There was a commitment that was led by, as you rightly said, an assessment of operational needs uh, led often by the practitioners and those on the, the front line uh, that, has that, that has contributed to uh, EU security development in a, a, a number of fields. And then we get up to uh, the referendum uh, and the period after that. Uh, the, the contribution was still going on. Uh, I mean, I, I came on the scene after the referendum vote. Uh, and during the three and a half years that I, I was in, in the Commission until the end of 2019, uh, as Commissioner for Security Union, uh, I saw that even as the UK was giving effect to the referendum vote and exiting, there was a continued contribution uh, in a number of areas related to security uh, by UK um, security actors. Uh, both helping uh, to think about, particularly how to tackle some of the new threats, uh, terrorism, extremism, the cyber, uh, hybrid, uh, and critical digital infrastructure challenges, uh, but not exclusively. Uh, uh, the UK continued to um, uh, be an actor all, all the way through that period. But of course, uh, that was taking place at the same time as negotiations and reflections on how the relationship would work in future, uh, given that the UK was leaving. Uh, on the foreign policy, the international security side, uh, there, there was quite a shift um, uh, during that period uh, from uh, the, the, the May government uh, to the uh, Johnson government. Uh, as you'll remember, uh, under Theresa May, uh, she went to the Munich Security Conference in 2018, gave a very positive, forward-looking uh, speech in which she said that 
uh, European security was the UK security. Uh, and the UK should be uh, finding ways to remain closely involved with a, a full range of European security, including um, uh, that foreign policy international security uh, dimension. Uh, uh, when uh, the Johnson government arrived, uh, there was a big shift. Uh, they made very clear that they did not want to have any structured form of cooperation on international security issues and that basically um, they could see that there might be some areas where the UK would work with the EU, but it would be uh, essentially ad hoc uh, and where it was in both sides' interests, i.e. they were saying when it was in their interests to find a way of uh, engaging. And that, that was a big shift, had a big impact, I think, on uh, the EU and how the EU saw its wider security cooperation with, uh, with the UK. Uh, on the range of internal security matters, uh, there was also a shift. And under the May government, the, the discussion has been going on, they've been trying to find ways of uh, maximizing the continuation of cooperation, given, obviously, uh, the important uh, difference that the UK would no longer be a member state. Uh, when uh, the Johnson government arrived, uh, they uh, approached this area uh, again differently. Uh, they highlighted the importance they attached to stripping EU law out of um, the framework for the future uh, relationship uh, and uh, the uh, need for them uh, politically to strip out uh, the ECJ as far as possible and certainly uh, in, in relation to uh, cooperation in, in this area on these internal security matters. And that uh, had uh, the effect of uh, complicating and to a degree limiting the possibilities for continued cooperation. But that said, uh, and um, uh, Peter Ricketts has heard me say this before, um, I hope he doesn't um, disagree, uh, the outcome of the TCA negotiations on this part three on the internal security matters is in my view better than might have been expected, uh, certainly given that background I've just described and the political limitations that the Johnson government were putting in place, better than expected. But uh, it's not um, uh, necessarily stable, and we have to think about that. Uh, that said, thirdly, if there's a will to cooperate and use it, I, I think it does provide uh, a platform for effective cooperation across quite a wide range of areas. So taking, taking those points in turn, uh, the, the outcome was uh, better than um, many, including me at, at various stages, uh, had uh, feared in a number of respects uh, as regards the, the key building blocks of cooperation in this area, uh, the, the key agencies, the uh, legal framework, uh, the databases, the importance of which you've already uh, underlined, and the other range of supporting networks that bind um, uh, the, the, the participants together uh, uh, across this area. So on uh, the agencies, uh, under the May government, there, there'd been a, an attempt to try and uh, maintain links with, with the agencies. There was even at one stage, some discussion about the possibility of, of, of recognizing, at least in some uh, respects, uh, e ECJ uh, jurisprudence as far as the, uh, the future relationship with the agencies uh, was going to be concerned. Now, th that wasn't going to happen uh, uh, under the Johnson uh, approach. Uh, indeed, as I've said, EU law had to come out uh, and no role for the ECJ. Uh, that said, the outcome of the negotiations preserved uh, a, a good basis for cooperation between the UK and key agencies like Europol and, and, and Eurojust. Uh, as good as any other 
third country, uh, and in some respects um, uh, better, uh, because it it was there was a conscious effort made to pick all of the positives out of different third country relationships and roll them up and combine them uh, and use them as the foundation for the relationship, future relationship between the uh, UK and these agencies. And uh, the development, the management and future development of those working relations were very largely uh, given to the the practitioners. They were given to the management boards of these agencies to, um, to operate. And those management boards, as you know, as many on the call will know, uh, are made up not of politicians, but of frontline practitioners, uh, police, uh, border guards, uh, immigration officers, whose job it is uh, to keep us safe and who therefore prioritize effective cooperation and those operational needs that you were talking about. So I think that that is positive. Uh, on the, uh, the legal framework uh, for, for cooperation across this area, uh, obviously there's a, there, there, are, there are a number of areas um, that uh, uh, were affected by the fact that the UK was leaving, uh, but one key um, area that attracted a lot of, uh, of discussion uh, was, extra, was extradition. Uh, at, there wasn't going to be uh, a possibility of continuing the European arrest warrant because that was a piece of EU uh, uh, legislation. Uh, it was a key piece of uh, brick in the EU legal um, construction here, and there was a, a large central role for the ECJ. And none of that was going to fit with the Johnson government view of, of, of the future relationship. But uh, building on precedents again, this time um, discussions that have taken place um, uh, over a number of years between the EU and, and Norway and Iceland, a conscious effort was made to develop not, not a piece of EU legislation, but a, 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 a framework that was then rooted in the, the TCA that delivered a very large part of the, the EAW's effect with, as we all know, um, some constraints, uh, particularly about the automaticity of surrendering uh, people being pursued uh, uh, with arrest warrants, uh, and uh, the possibility of some uh, national reservations. But the practitioners who'd been worried they were gonna lose this kind of instrument welcomed and continue to welcome uh, what was achieved in the, in the TCA. The databases. You mentioned, Helena, some of the some of the databases that that, that were preserved. Uh, the PRUM database on on fingerprints, DNA, vehicle registrations, and crucially, as it develops in future, crime scene evidence, forensic evidence, uh, was was preserved as um, a, a, a database that the UK could continue to. Um, participate in and play a, play a role in. Uh, uh, likewise, the, the databases, the so-called PNR databases that, that, that record and share information about people arriving into our, into our airports. The, these were databases that had been developed uh, outside of an EU framework that had been brought into an EU framework and a way was found therefore to maintain uh, a link with the UK after it, after it left. The core database that had been de developed uh, and built within the EU framework, uh, the uh, Schengen Information System, uh, which we can talk about a little bit more in, in, in later on if people are interested, uh, a huge and very important uh, police database consulted billions of times each year. Uh, it, it was not uh, extended for the UK to continue to participate in. Uh, and that was at least in part because of reservations on the EU side, because uh, they were not, um, they couldn't see a way of extending that database that was so firmly entrenched in the EU legal framework and where the ECJ was uh, intimately involved in how it operates to a third country that uh, had the kind of preconditions that the Johnson government had, had set out. So that is a gap 
that is quite an important gap in the arrangements that uh, uh, now exist for cooperation between the UK and the and the EU. Uh, there are various attempts being made to try and plug that gap to a certain extent uh, by greater use of the Interpol uh, databases and uh, the UK government have spoken in the past about also developing some new uh, means of cooperation with like-minded countries, Five Eyes and, and others to share those kind of uh, pieces of, of police information, in particular alerts about um, people of interest. Uh, and we can talk a little bit more if you want about how effective uh, that is, uh, but uh, that is one of the big uh, challenges uh, in the new in the new arrangements. But there was also progress on uh, continuing to find ways of involving the UK in uh, various networks that are important in cooperation in this area uh, to counter radicalization. Uh, to tackle dis and misinformation, including political um, dis and misinformation, and to build the um, cybersecurity, uh, collective cybersecurity around, for example, securing uh, our elections, our democratic processes, uh, and uh, uh, finding ways of better protecting our critical digital infrastructure. Quite a lot of that was. Um, not spelt out in a great deal of detail in, in the TCA, uh, but the door was left open to developing those links. There were, as you know very well, um, uh, two uh, key conditions to maintaining this new relationship uh, around um, respect for fundamental rights, human, right, human rights, uh, and uh, data adequacy. And that's why uh, my second point, that these relationships are not entirely stable uh, because uh, in particular uh, around questions of, of data adequacy, uh, there are some uh, outstanding, there are some, some outstanding questions, there are outstanding pressures. Uh, the relationship does exist, it's now a bit formalized, uh, but uh, there are uh, questions uh, around um, the way the UK handles uh, access to EU citizens' information by uh, intelligence and indeed law enforcement. Uh, and there are questions around how the UK handles the onward transmission of uh, EU citizens' data that's come to the UK onto other uh, third countries, which uh, mean that uh, the European Parliament and others are watching this area very closely. Uh, if uh, it, it, there is a will to find and ways of continuing to cooperate and develop that cooperation. Uh, I think that the arrangements that exist offer uh, lots of scope for uh, deepening uh, cooperation on issues like uh, a shared push on um, tackling cybercrime, uh, which has been exploding, as you know, uh, in recent years. There's a lot of focus at the moment on ransomware as a particularly pernicious form of, of, of cybercrime. Uh, and uh, the provisions in the TCA would allow the UK to continue to work very, very closely with Europol, which works on this through a body called EC3, uh, through the EU, EU Cyber Security Agency, ENISA, uh, in a way that I think would help to deliver uh, some of the uh, results that uh, the G7 uh, has called for, for example, in, in this area. Uh, and there's a potentially rich cooperation for, uh, agenda for cooperation around countering dis and misinformation. Again, uh, what the TCA sets out is permissive, but there is a, a strong uh, shared uh, interest in trying to tackle those sorts of challenges can complement the work that other organizations are doing, including NATO now that's um, started to take an interest in, in, in these areas, uh, but could certainly uh, be built upon uh, in the framework between the EU and, and the UK. Uh, and uh, this one is a bit more of a challenge. Uh, if, if there was the will to try and develop uh, further cooperation, uh, I hope it might be possible um, to look again at this question of how third countries, not just the UK, other like-minded third countries, might work more closely with the EU's core uh, law enforcement databases, including the Schengen Information System. 
Uh, I know that there are some people uh, within the EU uh, institutions who recognize that um, there would be a shared interest in, in trying to explore that. But uh, let's be realistic. The prospects uh, for developing further cooperation depend on that shared assessment and that shared will to, to make the necessary uh, engagements. And at the moment, uh, there are some question marks about that. We have to be, we have to be realistic. Uh, in particular, uh, there's um, some very difficult discussions going on, which, you, which we've no doubt come, will come up in some of the sessions later on this morning, uh, uh, around uh, Northern Ireland, uh, uh, which affect uh, the uh, relationship between the EU and the UK uh, in general, because they go uh, to questions of trust, which obviously essential uh, in this area, as in other areas. But they also uh, pose a specific challenge for developing cooperation in this area, it seems to me, of internal security. Because uh, were uh, the uh, discussions that are going on, as you said, the prospects look slightly better this week than, than last week. Uh, were the discussions going on to try and find a way forward on Northern Ireland uh, to break down? And were there to be a uh, crisis uh, around um, the triggering of, of so-called triggering of, of Article 16? Uh, the EU has made clear that it would, it would respond in, in those circumstances uh, uh, in a number of ways. Uh, up to and including the possibility of suspending uh, the TCA framework. So everything we've just been discussing in those circumstances could be suspended. But more immediately, uh, the, there's been some discussion about looking again at this question of data adequacy. And uh, as I've just been saying, that is one of the building blocks that uh, uh, will affect whether or not we're able to maintain cooperation in this area, let alone uh, develop it. So I think we do have to watch very closely the progress of those discussions between the EU and the UK on, on Northern Ireland. And lastly, I just wanted to come back to this question of uh, international uh, security uh, and foreign policy. As, as I've already said, as, as we know, uh, the, the Johnson government uh, uh, made it very clear that they didn't want to have structured cooperation on, on those issues. Uh, and indeed, some developments, some recent developments, uh, have, have further complicated uh, relations between the UK and, and the EU, in particular EU member states, around some of these international um, security issues. I'm thinking, for example, of the uh, of the relationship between the UK and France that has suffered after um, the, the submarine, uh, uh, the Australian submarine um, switch uh, and the establishment of a new uh, relationship between uh, Australia, the UK and the US. But all of that said, there is still uh, a good deal of cooperation on security issues between uh, the UK and uh, EU member states. There's bilateral cooperation, uh, there's cooperation in small groups, uh, there's cooperation through the G7, the G20, uh, the UN, there's obviously cooperation in, in NATO. Quite a lot of uh, uh, that cooperation can go on um, uh, uh, without uh, the UK having to um, change its approach to cooperation with the EU. But uh, unless and until it does change its uh, approach to cooperation with the e EU on these wider security measures, I, I think it will be limited uh, because of the nature of EU member states engagement in these issues, because they think that the EU can play a role as a security actor and they invest in uh, the EU as a security actor on many of these issues. There will continue to be um, bottom-up cooperation in particular areas on particular themes. There's, there's good cooperation between the UK and, and the EU member states on the Western Balkans at the moment. As I said, in the UN, both in New York and here in Geneva, uh, there is good cooperation on, on individual uh, issues. Uh, but 
Uh, a little bit like the internal security picture. The external security picture could develop further if there was the political will to, to do so. Um, without necessarily uh, developing uh, a formal or structured cooperation, I think it would just be easier if uh, the uh, UK was willing to acknowledge uh, the EU as a security actor in, in, in this field. Uh, I think that that would facilitate uh, greater cooperation across um, a range of issues and in uh, other frameworks and organizations. And it could be done, in my view, uh, without in any way undermining uh, the UK's sovereignty. So there we are, it's a mixed picture. It's better than it could have been. Uh, there are questions about the stability of the framework, uh, but if there were a political will, a shared political will to tackle some of these uh, shared challenges, then I think there is plenty of scope for uh, developing cooperation, both on the internal side and on the external side. I hope that gives some uh, points for discussion that you can pick up during the rest of, of, of the morning. Thank you so much, Sir Joan King. An excellent uh, talk about, you know, how did we get to where we are currently and where can we go from here? Namely, uh, outlining, uh, very importantly, the contribution of the UK, which maybe didn't come out uh, so as, as strongly in uh, my earlier introduction, but should have. Uh, so the uh, in contribution of the UK to the area from the, the development of the area from the justice and also, you know, what, you know, how the negotiations actually took place and actually some of the you know the results being actually not as negative as, as we earlier you know expected um, and how do we actually go from here in terms of you know it's quite a positive uh, picture in terms of the you know in terms of the the possibility that political will opens up uh, we now have about 25 uh, minutes for questions. Uh, as I get actually mentioned to the audience, I would kindly ask uh, everyone to actually uh, write their questions in the uh, in the chat box, and I will be very happy to read them uh, and uh, give them the floor to Sir Julian King. I have quite a few questions of my own as well, but I will obviously give priority to, to the audience. We already have a, a few of them coming through. So uh, first one is, could we expect the UK to get closer to the US to ask the EU to allow more specific agreements with third countries in these policy areas? And uh, while others, uh, while we wait for others, I'd like to actually probably collect a few uh, before giving the floor to Sir Julian. Um, I can just add a couple of my own. Uh, what are the alternatives that are being developed to compensate uh, the, the loss of access to, Schengen, to the Schengen information system? Um, there's also another question here. Is it really possible to preserve operational cooperation from politics? For instance, uh, recent tensions between France and Britain had a direct impact on the ground with officials from the French Home Office not allowed to speak to their British homologues. Um, and I think, you know, three questions is, is quite already enough to, to start us with. So I'll give the floor to, to Julian while we wait for others uh, to actually other questions to come through. Um, the, uh, we have, oh yes, we have different uh, uh, chat boxes. I have to be, uh, have to uh, make sure I actually, and there's a, a fourth question we can ask, we can add a fourth question to this round. Is there a danger that respective EU member states judiciaries, such as the German federal courts in Karl, apologize for my German, Karlsruhe, could make rulings in the future that prohibit elements of UK EU security relations? It has made previous rulings over the EAW. Sir Julian, would you like to take the, this round of questions at this stage? Uh, well, there's two, there's two quite technical questions, and then there's two bigger um, political questions, if you like. I'll, I'll start with trying to address the, the more technical questions, uh, and then I'll say a few words about the other questions. I'm uh, conscious that you will have um, uh, people on your, on your panels that are coming up who will be able to speak with a great deal of authority on some of these uh, wider political issues. Uh, on... Uh, on the uh, gap that is left 
by the UK not being part of the Schengen information system. Uh, this, this is recognized by uh, uh, both sides, the EU and the UK. Uh, and the, uh, there is an attempt to try and plug it, as I mentioned. Uh, the uh, UK has said uh, that it will use the uh, Interpol uh, databases that exist. Um, for sharing alerts around um, ob objects and people of, of interest. A and it's asked uh, its partners uh, across Europe, uh, including the EU member states, uh, to share the information that they share amongst themselves on the Schengen information system over those Interpol uh, databases so that the UK can continue to um, uh, work with that information and, and reciprocate by sharing uh, information across those Interpol databases. Uh, and uh, there are some indications that that, that, that is taking place. Uh, and some of the practitioners who've been talked to over recent months uh, have said that, 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 it's, that it's effective. They are managing to uh, continue to share uh, a lot of information that is operationally uh, useful. But it, it requires uh, an additional effort by uh, the UK's partners, because you're basically asking them to, to, as some people say, double key. You're asking them to put this information in to the Schengen information system, and you're asking them then to put it into the Interpol uh, system as well. Uh, and so it's extra work for them. Uh, that it's happening because everybody recognizes that it makes a, a difference and, and delivers a, a benefit. But it, it does also mean that the nature of the overall relationship is important because it, it, if the overall relationship is positive, then you know, perhaps you're uh, willing as the Belgian authorities or, or, or another member state authorities to make that extra effort. If the overall relationship it is it is more problematic, then uh, maybe uh, you are slightly less willing to devote the additional resources and time to this particular uh, aspect. So uh, the, you, to make this work, uh, uh, both sides are making an effort and the UK is requiring EU member states to make an extra effort. There um, uh, are also some questions um, that, that I think remain to be answered about how uh, easy it is uh, to plug, uh, for the UK in particular, to plug that information uh, into frontline police, uh, police officers, uh, um, where relevant border guards and immigration officers. Uh, the Schengen information system was and is for the EU member states, uh, very effectively integrated from all the way through from those putting the, putting the information in all the way through to those on the front line who can use that information and consult it in real time. Uh, and that took quite a long time to develop, quite a lot of resources. Uh, and that isn't uh, the case for the Interpol uh, databases at the moment. So uh, the UK has to work out how it can get the information to its frontline police officers. And if there's a piece of UK information that's only being shared across the Interpol databases, other EU member states have to work out how they make sure that that information is integrated into the systems that they've got plugged into Schengen that go right to their frontline practitioners as well. So there are some practical issues there. Uh, as I mentioned, there's also been some discussion about uh, from, from the UK side uh, about um, developing some uh, alternative additional uh, uh, networks for sharing this kind of information on alerts. Uh, with other uh, like-minded uh, countries. Personally, I think that would be very positive. Uh, in the longer term, uh, we should be trying to do that uh, together, uh, the UK and the EU and other like-minded countries because of the benefits uh, uh, of sharing this kind of information in, in, in tackling those who are presenting a shared challenge to us. Uh, but but it, that is a longer term, uh, that is a longer term prospect. Uh, on uh, the question of court uh, rulings. I mean, I think this is one of the 
I, I, I was trying to think of, 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 a, of a German case, and I can't think of one right now. Perhaps, perhaps you've got experts on the call who, who can. But I think there is, a, there is an issue uh, relating to the stability of the arrangements that, that we're talking about uh, and how susceptible they are to um, uh, court rulings. I, I'm encouraged by the latest developments but you'll have experts on the call who, who've been following this in a great deal of detail, I'm sure, uh, in, in, um, in Ireland, because there were uh, uh, cases brought in Ireland to challenge uh, whether or not uh, the TCA surrender arrangements, uh, uh, EAW successor arrangements and TCA surrender arrangements should apply uh, to and in Ireland. Uh, and uh, the Irish courts and the EU courts subsequently are saying that they should uh, because uh, it, it's in everybody's interests to uphold the TCA. Uh, so they have ruled on the basis of the, 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 what's set out in the TCA. Uh, and I think that that, is, that should give us some uh, reassurance uh, that uh, the TCA itself and the, the detailed uh, legal arrangements that are set out there are going to be used by courts, including uh, the EU courts, to um, uh, enforce the cooperation that is envisaged. Uh, now, I'm sure you're going to have somebody who can come up with a counter case, but I'm, I'm encouraged, at least by the latest developments. Now, on the wider questions. Uh, 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 Peter Ricketts will have views on, on um, relationships between France and the UK um, uh, uh, as a, a former ambassador in Paris um, for longer than me. Uh, I, I think that uh, the fallout from um, uh, uh, the Australian submarine deal uh, and general pressures and tensions uh, 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 around how France perceived the British government to be um, working with the EU and sticking to or not sticking to uh, the agreements that were reached with the EU in the withdrawal agreement, in particular around Northern Ireland, have had a pretty uh, big impact on the bilateral relationship and different aspects of, 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 of cooperation, uh, including on, on security. Uh, uh, fortunately, uh, there is a deep security relationship there, both on, on, on the, the military um, uh, side and on, uh, despite what you might read in the newspapers, including today, uh, and on um, cooperation around um, handling migration and border issues. Uh, but um, I think there's a bit of a freeze on uh, developing uh, those relationships. And I just really do hope that they don't um, go backwards. Uh, there is a clearly uh, a risk. Uh, and I think that that is something that we, we should be trying in, in any way we can to uh, encourage both the UK and the French authorities to try and manage as well they can uh, to maintain that vital cooperation. On relationship with the US, uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure I've quite seized the, the, the question properly. Uh, the, um, the, the fact that the UK is a third country now um, means that there is a group of third countries uh, including the US, uh, uh, that uh, have shared security interests with the e EU. And um, together, uh, uh, they may be able to affect the way the EU thinks about some specific uh, uh, arrangements. Uh, as I said, one area where I think that this would be uh, politically useful uh, would be if if the EU and third countries uh, were able to share some of the, some of the police information uh, across the databases more effectively. Uh, uh, the only reservation I have uh, uh, around 
this, what I think lies behind this question, is that, for example, on uh, the defense side, uh, uh, the military security side, uh, the uh, group of third countries who've been pressing the EU to be a bit more open uh, to cooperation uh, includes the US, Canada, uh, uh, Turkey sometimes, uh, and some of those countries have persuaded the EU to open up the prospect of cooperation on development of the individual projects to develop military corporate capabilities um, called PESCO in, in the jargon. Uh, there is no sign at the moment that the UK is interested in pursuing that kind of uh, that kind of closer cooperation. So, um, so uh, regrettably, I think at the moment, because of the political constraints, it may be that the UK is at the back of the queue of third countries that are pressing for closer cooperation uh, on security issues with with the EU. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to now start a second round of questions. <laughs> so I could, I'd like to ask the uh, audience to actually uh, enter their questions on the uh, Q and A uh, chat. Uh, I have a question here by Dr. Hager uh, Chapal, and uh, she asks: Have UK law enforcement and other European police forces been involved in Brexit negotiations? And I would uh, also like to. Um, well, Take this advantage of, of being uh, chair to actually ask another one of my own. Um, I was particularly, this is probably, uh, this might sound like a bit of a naive question, really, but how can we explain that the result was actually better than expected? So, I, uh, so you know, during a number of interviews uh, that I've conducted with policymakers, the time and time again comes the idea that actually everyone had a much more uh, pessimistic idea about the results, uh, even until the end. So, you know, some people were actually thinking that actually there would be no result in terms of there would be no agreement. Um, and so how can we actually explain that in for the area of Justin Home Affairs, actually we got a better result. And I was wondering whether this, uh, the result actually also kind of reflects very much the idea that um, recently uh, Professor Kristen Kalnert was actually here as well, together with uh, Professor Sarah Leonard and Dr. Alex McKenzie wrote a inter very interesting piece, which was about the position of exceptionalism of the UK, the vision of itself as being exceptional and how that reflects in its uh, negotiation, how it reflected itself in the negotiations. And I was wondering whether actually the, you know, the, that actually that vision of itself as being exceptional and as actually, uh, you know, being maybe entitled to a specific relationship with you, actually whether that had, uh, you know, partially explains the, the result, you know, the result that we got. Thank you. Please feel free to continue to actually add your questions to the Q&A and I will read them as soon as, I, as they arrive. Shall I have a go at trying to answer those questions? Thank you. Um, so the first one's fairly straightforward. Uh, uh, the police forces and indeed other frontline practitioners, um, I, I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, border guards, immigration officers, a number of other um, uh, law enforcement practitioners uh, from both sides, both from the EU side and from uh, the UK side, were involved in formulating the positions uh, for the negotiation. Uh, they weren't um, involved in the actual uh, negotiations very much because the negotiations took place between, between the negotiating teams uh, uh, who uh, worked you know, all, all the way through um, a, a year for the withdrawal agreement, slightly over, and then all the way through another year for the TCA. But they drew upon the expertise and experience of the frontline practitioners. And I think, uh, as I hope I suggested, uh, it, it was the frontline practitioners underlining the importance of working together that helped to secure some of the results that we've, that we've got. Uh, and it is the networks of cooperation between the frontline practitioners that make me optimistic uh, about how some of the aspects of the agreement we've got um, are going to work out, uh, in particular around the agencies, where it is the frontline practitioners who will be effectively responsible for taking forward how those, how those agencies and the relationship between the EU and the UK uh, work in practice. Um, 
the other questions, I mean, I ask, my, I ask myself that question quite a lot um, uh, recently. Um, uh, something being better than expected, of course, depends upon your baseline. What are your expectations? Uh, and I think uh, that for various reasons, the, the overall expectations were um, at times during the TCA process really quite low because the negotiations were proving so difficult and because the overall relationship was proving very difficult. Uh, and that some of it related specifically to cooperation in this area. This is one of the areas, not the only area, but this is one of the areas where uh, trust is absolutely vital to making um, arrangements work. Uh, and, you know, trust levels at various points, particularly during the TCA negotiations, were really, really quite low. Um, and I think that caused people to worry in particular about, about this area. Um, and then there were some specifics that had affected expectations around this area. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the shift in uh, the arrival of the Johnson government that broke off discussions about wider security, international security cooperation. That had a big, I'm, you know, I was there when it happened, that had a big impact uh, in, in Brussels. Uh, some people would say because um, you know, the EU uh, understood uh, its interests in having that kind of cooperation with uh, the UK, and so it was, an, it, it was a knock to the EU's interests. I'd be a bit more charitable. Uh, I think it's just that uh, they, they wanted, this was an area where they saw there was a deep shared interest, and they wanted to uh, continue to to, to work together and, and, and some on the EU side thought that working together on these wider security issues could generate a positive momentum that could help the overall relationship. And so it was quite a big knockback for those who thought that way. Uh, and then the limitations that the Johnson government put around, reinforced uh, around internal security cooperation that I mentioned, uh, the, you know, the, the, uh, the the impossibility for them of rolling on EU legal frameworks for cooperation because of the role of the ECJ um, meant that, uh, again, people had to sort of start with a blank sheet of paper. And how easy was it going to be to import uh, some of the structures for cooperation into a new treaty with a new treaty base, which is effectively what in the end was achieved with TCA. Uh, and at least for a period, there was, there was, a, there was some real concerns about how, how far you would be able to do that. How easy would it be to do in practice, even if you wanted to do it? Uh, and one of the areas where I think expectations were exceeded was that through a lot of hard work uh, and investment from both sides, from the EU side and from the UK side, they found ways of uh, re reproducing you know, really quite detailed, if you look at the TCA, um, uh, really quite detailed legal arrangements that both sides could settle upon. So it's better than expected because expectations were driven down. Thank you so much. And I think we have four minutes left. So I think I'll just like to read this last question that I have here. Could we expect Britain to make the most of its physical presence in Europol's headquarters to influence the EU agency? And uh, if yes, then how? Uh, well, that, I mean, as, as asked, that sounds like, you know, a third country coming in and trying to influence in some way, perhaps negatively, uh, the way Europol develops. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm sure it wasn't meant that way. Uh, I, I hope, that the UK engagement in Europol will continue to be very active. Uh, certainly that has been the case for, for, for a long time, uh, as you know, um, it was UK national led Europol for uh, a long period of time. And uh, uh, over that time, uh, UK police engagement with, uh, and other law enforcement bodies engagement with Europol increased significantly. 
uh, and they saw the benefits of that. So I am hopeful that they will continue to find ways of being very actively engaged, at least as actively engaged as the, the US um, third country representatives in, in Europol. And to mutual benefit, uh, they, they will continue to get a lot of benefit from cooperation with uh, EU partners. And I hope that EU partners will continue to get some benefit uh, from their cooperation and, and leadership uh, in, in some fields uh, uh, in tackling a whole range uh, of crime uh, challenges, but particularly perhaps the cyber crime challenges. Thank you so much. I think I have read all the questions on either of the chats. So I think that if there are no further questions from the audience, then I think uh, I would like to thank Sir Julian King very much for actually joining us today and for an excellent talk and give us giving us a you know a real insight into actually what is you know what the current debates and the current issues are, uh, currently uh, are and how we might you know uh, solve them uh, in the future. So thank you very much for uh, this excellent talk. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And I, I shall stay on, if I may, to listen to some of the subsequent discussion. Thank you very much.